Hello, I'm Dave Hurst, CTO of Athena Security, and today we're going to talk about managing firewall security for PCI DSS compliance. You know, data breaches at merchant locations and credit card processors are occurring with increasing frequency. Unfortunately, all too often, misconfigured firewalls were found to be involved in the reasons for these data breaches. Consequently, the PCI data security standard requirements are becoming much more stringent. QSAs are looking at networks in much more detail. And firewalls play an important role in securing your network. So Q QSAs are looking at these firewalls in much more detail. So today we're going to discuss what are the compliance requirements for firewall security, what are auditors looking for during an assessment review, what are common pitfalls during an assessment, and what can you do to be prepared for a PCI assessment by doing your own self-assessment. PCI DSS 1.2 defines 12 high-level requirements for PCI compliance. Many of these address application security, vulnerability management, or process issues. Of these 12, requirement 1 and some of the control items in requirement 2 specifically address firewall configurations. Let's look at these in a little more detail. Control items 1.1 and 1.2 specifically address how the configuration addresses insecure services. What services are being allowed, uh, what services are actually necessary, and it requires you to justify the services that uh, are passed by the firewall. Requirement 1.3 specifically addresses the DMZ and restricting traffic into and out of the DMZ. And to make sure that access is not available to the locations where PCI data is being stored in your network. Section 2.2.1 requires that you implement only one primary function for, per server. This means that you cannot implement web services and FTP and mail and DNS and so forth on one server in your DMZ. Instead, they have to be separated uh, and provided by separate pieces of hardware. This can also be enforced by your firewall in that it will only allow one service to any given server. And then section 2.3 addresses access to the firewall and requires that any console administrative access must be encrypted, either using SSH or uh, using VPNs. The role of a firewall in your network is to partition the network into separate zones and to control access to services between those zones. So within that context, the QSA will be looking for these issues in the firewall configs. The first one is segmentation. How does the firewall divide the network into different segments? Traditional segmentation uh, divides the network into three zones. The external zone, which would be basically the internet or the public zone. The internal network, which is all of your internal systems. And the DMZ, which is the semi-public zone where the internet has access to services that you are providing. When credit card data is involved, segmentation issues become much more complex, as we'll see shortly. The second thing your auditor is going to look for is inbound access controls. That is, what services are allowed to the DMZ, what services are allowed to credit card holder data stores, and he's going to look at what networks have access to these things. The third thing the auditor is going to look at is outbound access. That is, what is allowed out from the systems that are managing credit card data. And this is going to look at all of the networks that are, reached, that are reachable through the firewall. So let's look at an example. Uh, this is actually derived from a network of a large retailer that has many locations uh, around the country. We notice in this diagram that there are already a number of different zones that have been defined. There is the e-commerce infrastructure, there are payment processors, there are retail sites, there's transaction processing, uh, and then there's general uh, corporate internal networks. And we notice that these are all divided in a number of different ways. Looking at the e-commerce infrastructure, we see, for example, a web DMZ. This would uh, provide servers that 
implement uh, websites and these are publicly accessible. We see that there's a firewall that separates the web DMZ from the internet and controls access from the public side. There's also a firewall on the back end of the network that controls access into the internal network uh, of the company. There may be other uh, elements of an e-commerce infrastructure as well. Uh, we see uh, VPNs for uh, partner connections. These may uh, allow uh, communication with uh, partner companies or, or other business partners. And these again are protected by firewalls that segment out those DMZs uh, as, as necessary. So when a customer comes to the, the corporate website and initiates a transaction, data is going to travel from that web DMZ through the corporate network to the transaction processing center. These are where the mainframes uh, process the transaction. They may provide inventory management, uh, they'll keep track of customer data records, and they may also be storing credit card data. So this section of the network has to be protected, and we see that there is a firewall here as well, segmenting it from the rest of the internal corporate network. Finally, the completion of the transaction processing will send the credit card data to the payment processors so that the transaction be, can be cleared. In this example, we see uh, connections to several payment processors, RBC, Payment Tech, PayPoint, and so forth. These are external connections. The data here is leaving the organization, and once it does so, it's no longer uh, of, of your concern. But these connections, again, have to be protected by a firewall and segmented off so that there is no way for uh, malicious access through the payment processors into your network. Another place where credit card transactions may come from are from the actual retail sites. Again, uh, partitioned out and uh, identified as separate zones. Each store will have many point of sale terminals. These terminals uh, will collect credit card data uh, and perform some initial transaction, but that data again gets trans transmitted through the corporate backbone back to the transaction processing mainframes uh, where the transactions are, are completed and then the data is sent on to the payment processors. So we see that there are actually multiple modes of access uh, uh, for the credit card data to enter the network and that data in motion has to be controlled, it has to be encrypted so that it cannot be intercepted and when the data is being stored, for example in the transaction processing area, uh, that has to be again protected so that uh, uh, people cannot uh, access it in an unauthorized manner. Finally, we see the internal corporate network, and this is going to be administrative networks, uh, maybe accounting, uh, maybe application development, uh, and other operational areas uh, relevant to the business of the, the organization. Uh, we see corporate LAN, there may be server farms, and so forth. And again, segmentation plays an important role here because we don't want Joe in accounting to have uh, unauthorized access to the, the uh, credit card data that might be stored in uh, the, the transaction processing area. So again, segmentation becomes very important. The firewall configurations define these network segments, but they also define the security posture at layer three and four for your network. As such, these configurations reveal how well your security policies have been implemented. This is, this is because the configurations are actually defining the behavior of the firewalls. And therefore, that indicates what the actual policy is on the network. And so that defines your security posture. The QSAs will be looking at the configurations, so you need to review them as well. There are a number of things that uh, will reveal how well your security policy has been implemented. These include things like the uh, access control lists in the configuration, uh, address translations, uh, routing configurations, VPN configurations, and so forth. These will all show how the security policy has been implemented. Another thing to keep in mind is that every time a configuration changes, your security posture changes as well. And so you need to make sure that the changes that are being applied are actually the correct changes and that they don't introduce uh, side effects that might open up uh, access that was unintended or uh, allow dangerous or potentially risky services through the firewall. 
So you want to be reviewing your security policy on a regular basis, particularly when they change, and to make sure that the, uh, the configurations and network behavior are actually in sync with your security policy. As I mentioned earlier, proper segmentation is key to your security posture, but this is only the first step. Making sure that zones are properly separated is important, but next you have to identify all of the services that are allowed into or out of the zones and justify them. For example, um, we see here that HTTP is being allowed into a particular network which may be containing uh, the sensitive credit card data. Why is that being allowed? The QSA is going to ask you to justify these services, so you have to come up with a business reason for these services to be uh, implemented. If they're not required, then again you have to detect them and make sure that they are removed from the firewalls uh, so that those modes of access are disallowed. In addition to the access lists, address translations will add significantly to your complexity. So simply reviewing the firewall configuration is not enough. You have to understand how the configuration will make the firewall behave. A firewall in a typical organization may have hundreds or even thousands of rules. These configurations are very complex. Even in a small configuration with maybe 50 or 60 rules, a lot of objects and maybe four or five network interfaces will quickly get beyond your ability to understand all of the interactions and implications of what's going on. When the configuration gets even larger to hundreds or thousands of rules, at this scale it becomes impossible to manually understand what's going on. There's just too many things, too, too much complexity for the human mind to understand. In order to deal with this, you need to use automated tools that are capable of evaluating the access control lists, the network address translations, routes, VPN configurations, and so forth, uh, and to understand all of the combinations of these configurations for all sources, destinations, and services. The automated tools will identify precisely what hosts have access to the critical servers and what your exposures are to dangerous or potentially risky services. These tools will then generate reports consistently, quickly, and accurately. You, will, you know that the QSAs are using these tools because they are required to show a, a very detailed level of understanding when, of the network security when doing an audit. So, you can use these same tools to do your own self-assessment on a regular basis so that when the PCI compliance audit time comes around, you can be sure that you're not going to fall into any of these possible pitfalls. As we've discussed, automated tools are the best approach for ensuring PCI compliance. Athena Security offers tools and services for automated firewall auditing and PCI compliance. Our Firepack product delivers a state-of-the-art network security solution for these kinds of audits and uh, compliance assessments. For more information, please visit our website, www.athenasecurity.net.